Welcome to Wine for Normal People, the podcast for people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. I'm your host, Elizabeth Schneider, author of the Wine for Normal People book and certified wine dork. And I'm MC Ice, just a wine-loving normal person. This podcast is sponsored by Wine Access. Check out the Wine Access Wine for Normal People Halloween pack coming up. You know Halloween's my favorite holiday. And Wine Access and I joined up to get you some Spooky, delightful wines. Wineaccess.com slash WFMP. Listen in the middle of the show for more details. Candy pairings not included. We're going to do a reboot this week. This is a pretty big one. Something we haven't covered in like 10 years, 12 years. What? Pinot Noir. Doesn't your mom say Pinot Noir? How does she say yeah, it? She, she does says kind it of kind of funny that. like yes. that. Yeah, it's, I mean, look. Look, it's better than Shiraz. What do they call it? Shiraz? So, yeah, they, they, they mix come, they, Syrah they, they and Shiraz together. Syrah and Shiraz. Shiraz. Yeah, yes, I think that's, that's right. that's what it is. Yes. yes. I will give the I am an American spiel here and say, I do call it Pinot Noir. I'm going to say it the way that we say How do they say, say it in it. France? I believe Forvo it's something like what you're... No, I think it's like Pinot Noir, but it just doesn't sound right. It sounds So we're not going to say that. We're going to call this Pinot Noir. And this is the refresh because a lot has happened with Pinot in the last 10 or 12 years. My understanding of the grape and teaching about it because I do teach a Pinot around the world class. Yeah, it's gotten hotter so it doesn't grow anywhere anymore. It's done. Uh, <laughs> it's a really great insight, MCIC. Look, again, Claudette's going to be very disappointed at how much you know. What do you mean she's going to be disappointed? I, I don't She's know. a little proud of me. I think. Definitely, there are some issues with climate change, what you're talking about or what you referenced. There are some areas that have definitely benefited from it, and the Pinot is much, much better than it used to be. And then there's some areas where it's getting a little dicey. The Antarctic Pinot really has come along in the last decade or so. I agree. You know, you joke about that, but there's now wine Pinot, especially being made in Patagonia. What? What? Which is not really that far away. No, it's not. Yeah. And in the really southern reaches of Chile. Jeez, you got to be kidding. No. And before, I think when we did this show, maybe there was a little bit, but it's definitely taken off. So it's not a joke that that is not so inaccurate. Can we quickly say that our patrons are awesome and that we want to do a shout out for them? And that we would like to do some shout outs for them. Oh, absolutely. If you would like to join the community, patreon.com slash wine for normal people it's just great i love the weekly discussion question everybody yells at me and they're like your poll choices are horrible i don't come up with good but the polling department i'm sorry not me the polling department which okay it is me but i don't come up with good options in my defense say that patreon's polls are a little bit limited this is in just a discussion topic and that's the whole point so it's just fun discussion topics and this week, we were talking about tasting room fees and whether or not what people should pay. And it was kind of cool because we had some winemakers and winery owners jump in because they are patrons also. And I will start the shout outs actually with one winery owner who just joined, Bruce Murray from Boundary Breaks, who's been on the show. I'm hoping to have him on again. He's just such a cool guy. And he's got that amazing radio voice. If you haven't listened to that Boundary Breaks podcast in the Finger Lakes, you definitely need to get on it. Really interesting guy and fantastic wines. Those wines blow the doors off Riesling. Everything they make is just really, really amazing. So Bruce joins. So he's a winery owner and he got to look at all of that information. But it's mostly just all of us hanging out, all the normal people. So you can join this crew if you decide to join Patreon. And I am sorry, I think I might have done some of these shout outs already. So if I didn't, I got a little bit behind on some of them and I just want to make sure everybody gets there. So Sabitha T, Gilbert L, Melissa K, Leah, Claudia, Steve P, William V, Laura J, Mark C, Scott B, Vikram P, Rich N and Jessica C. We changed the rules for shout out. So you have to be a patron for three months. Jessica C likes to keep it clean. It's Mario C. Thank you. Anyway, just want to say you guys are awesome. Patreon is the lifeblood. It's what keeps us going. And we try to give back as much as possible. So if you join Patreon, we would love it. In addition, guess what? We are taking another group to Piedmont. You can only do that if you're a patron. So that is happening. 
Uh, yeah, another one without you. So when you say we... I'm saying me and Teresimo, my uh, travel partner, and my partner in crime, Sylvia, yes. who is the co-tour leader with me. We're going to have a great time. So those are the perks of Patreon. Hopefully you will think about joining. It does keep the work going. Podcasting seems like it's free, but it's not free. So I'll give my spiel at another point in time. But let's get to Pino. Pino is a red grape. Did you know that? Uh, they call it a black grape, actually. Black grape. Mm, I always thought of it as red. Sorry. It's a red wine. Yeah. And it is responsible for the most expensive wines in the world. Should it, though? Should it what? Be responsible. Is it that good? It can be. It's not when it's not made well, but it can be. I have never had Romani Conti or Latache or Richborg or Le Chambertin. On the limestone escarpment of Burgundy, but I can tell you. Name dropping, (laughs) jeez. Well, I'm not sure if it's name dropping if I tell you that I've never had them and probably never will. Yeah, but you know what they are. (laughs) Yes, but if anybody listen, if you go back and listen to the Cote Nuit podcast, then you will also know what they are. So I assume prior knowledge here because we've already covered it. Peanut is not like Cabernet. Cabernet is so easy to grow. It grows almost anywhere. You can't grow it in places that are too cold, but it can grow in some marginal climates. Pinot is not like that. It's grown in the cooler vineyards around the world, and it is incredibly difficult in the vineyard. It's hard in the cellar as well, and that leads to the fact that it is always going to be more expensive oh, than really? Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, really? It's not just the vineyard. No. It's, oh. it's t- requires Why is it hard lot. in the cellar? Well, well, we'll talk about that. Well, that's why I tuned in. Jeez. And we know, and anyone that's listening to this who's ever had Pinot knows, the styles range enormously. You have these elegant and incredibly nuanced versions from Burgundy or sometimes nice. they're really boring and like metallic disgustingness from Burgundy if they're bad. Other cooler climate areas make lighter styles. And then you get California and New Zealand and Oregon. Oregon. Yes. And you're going to get a variety of flavors. And let's not forget about the world's best sparkling wine in my opinion at least, champagne, champagne and sure. many other sparkling wine regions around the world use Pinot as a major component. It's also a big component in rosé in many places, mm. not in Provence, but in many places. And the thing about Pinot is that it is very old. It is over 2,000 years old. It's an ancient grape. We have no idea what the parentage is. It is likely only a couple generations away from wild grapevines, which is, that's really unusual these days. Most of those grapes have not survived, but Pinot has. It was first mentioned, although we know that it grew before then, it was first mentioned under the name Morion in the 13th century in northern France. Why did it have that name? There are some nicer explanations and some worse ones. One is that more the Moors, they had dark skin. The grape had dark skin. That is horribly racist. Oh my but God, some, yes, you gotta be kidding. No, so that that's one <laughs> oh supposition. God. I like it better that it is from Moor, M-O-U-R, oh, which is a local name for Blackberry. And then Le Moray is a river in the Ile de France where Pinot was widely planted. So maybe it came from that. And Norien Noir was a name used in the Cote d'Or. So how do you know that it, It extends even back before then. Because if we look at other records, Mm -hmm. I believe that they there have been references. There's just no name. Uh, It's not a named grape. But we assume after looking at how much it's been used Uh that it's likely 2000 years old or more. That makes sense. Again, there's no way to tell, but it's pretty clear that this grape has been around a long, long, long time. I am sure that there's some bottles that are aging under the sea somewhere from 2,000 years ago. Oh, we're going to cover that Are at you some really? Point. Pinot comes from, and Pinot is used for a lot of different grapes, but it's pine because a pine cone is this triangular type shaped cluster. So wait, the name. Wait, wait, it's not related to No, it's pine. not related it's to just, pine cone. No, it's the same shape. It grows in a it's, shape yes, of a pine cone correct. is what you're saying. Okay. Correct. Pinot has spawned many children At least 21 grapes have come through spontaneous crosses between Pinot and a grape called Gouet Blanc. Pinot grew in the Middle Ages, and it was cultivated by the nobles and by the monks, and peasants grew Gouet Blanc. 
the vineyards were close to each other, mm-hmm. the monks' vineyards and the peasants' vineyards, and there was cross-pollination that happened. Also, it might have been done by people. We don't know. But out of that cross came Chardonnay, Aligote, Oxewa, Gamay, Melon de Bourgogne, the grape of Muscadet, mm-hmm. and many, many others. It's actually really fascinating if you look at the lineage of Pinot and how many amazing grapes it has spawned. It has also spawned my least favorite grape in the entire world, Pinotage, as it was crossed with Senso in South Africa at, at the University of Stellenbosch. Why do you dislike it so much? Pinotage, because it tastes like dried paint. And if I wanted dried paint, I just eat it. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, it could be the parent of Savignon, Savignin, as I always call it, because it's, it's S-A-V-A-G-N-I-N. If it is a parent of Savignon, then it is the grandparent of Savignon Blanc, Chenin Blanc, Grunewaldliner, and Cabernet Savignon. And it also has mutated many times because it's so old. Mm-hmm. So you have Pinot Noir, which is likely closest to the original. Then you have Pinot Gris which is the pink version of it, right? right? Pinot Gris is actually a pink-skinned grape. Hmm. Pinot Blanc, Pinot Munet, which is used in Champagne. Champagne, sure. And it can also be a grandparent of Syrah. So all of these really point to the pedigree of Pinot and how very important it is in the wine world, which is why it is important to know about Pinot, even if you don't love the grape. I mean, it sounds like it's one of the OGs of grapes. It absolutely is. Wine grapes, in, anyway. in modern history. Yeah. In modern history. Sure. That being said, there's a lot of Greek grapes that have been around and Italian grapes that have been around a long time. But yes, in the world of French grapes, this is definitely one of the oldest, if not the oldest. Jeez. You remember that Cabernet Sauvignon was a cross in the vineyards of likely Bordeaux. That didn't come around until the 17th century. Oh, I always think so, of it being as a lot older. No, Cabernet Sauvignon was the love child of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. So those grapes have been around a long time, mm-hmm. but not Cabernet Sauvignon. In terms of climate, Pinot is incredibly selective, will be nice about it, in saying that it is <coughs> High really... Maintenance. Really not well suited to most places. It has to have moderate to cool climates and a long growing season to build flavor and maintain acidity. It can't be too wet or too cool, even though it likes it cool. So in Burgundy, you have this very cool winter and you have summers that can be quite warm, but it gets cool at night. But then you've got problems, right? Where it is cool, you have spring frost, you have hail, you've got rain in the growing season, which usually is not a problem, but it can be for Pinot. And then you have rain in October, which if the vintage goes a little bit late, you've got problems. All of these can spoil the wine. Sometimes, at least in the past, now that's not an issue, it used to not get fully ripe in Cote d'Or, in Burgundy. It's not really a problem now, but it needs warm days and cool nights, but not too hot, because if it's hot, then it's going to ripen too quickly. You don't get any nuance. The berries can get sunburn on them. You can get a jammy, flat wine. It needs to ripen over time. So if it's too warm, Pinot is hosed. Oh my God, it's the Elizabeth of wines. Yes, it can it have like a It can't get too hot during the day. It needs cool evenings. Yes, I get it. Right. Right. I need. I have my you four have or five degree, degree band. range that you can operate in. It's yes. true. I really do. Where I'm happy. I actually really don't mind cold weather. It's the hot weather that bothers uh. me. Pinot does best in continental locations at a lower latitude and a high altitude, or you have to have some sort of marine influence or some sort of cool breeze that's coming in from somewhere. Because if you don't have that, Pinot is not going to do well. And also for soil types, marl, which is a combination of limestone and clay, loam is only good if it's going to have some calcareous stuff in it. So it's got to be marl, limestone with clay, to weigh it down a little bit. The grape... Because it is so finicky, I can't really tell you what a Pinot is going to taste like unless you tell me where it's grown. It's so influenced by terroir that it's an incredibly inconsistent traveler. If it's a cooler climate, it's going to be light in body normally, light in color for sure. If it's a warm climate, it's going to be very dark in color. If it's a cooler climate, you're going to get things like strawberry and sour cherry and cranberry and pomegranate and currant. I'm glad you said that because there are some that I absolutely love and others that 
I can't believe it's the same grape. And it absolutely tracks because some are also like black fruit and they're high in alcohol and they're incredibly heavy and they are filled with oak also, which is a winemaker choice. But there are also a lot of secondary flavors. If they don't annihilate it with oak and they allow the grape to ripen over a long period of time, you're going to get things like earth Mm -hmm. and dried herbs, mushrooms and truffles and nuts And then from the oak, you can get smoke. Forest floor is common. And from the winemaking, sometimes you will get farmyard or Band-Aid or things like that because it is susceptible to Britannomyces, which we'll talk about. Then from the texture standpoint, it can either be very high in acidity or it can be moderate in acidity. It can have lower tannin or it can have moderate tannin. It can be silky or it can be very brawny and heavy. Sometimes it can be like just flat too or just just heavy like so much oak right like you just smell that and then with age the better versions are going to be like leather and spice and incense black tea curry Mm. they're velvety they're silky they're beautiful but this grape doesn't age like cabernet sauvignon so although there are examples of it aging it really doesn't hit that pinnacle like Cabernet you can really age for a very long time and it will still keep a lot of its character and get better Pinot doesn't do that as much we'll talk about that a little bit later I do want to talk about the grape in the vineyard and one thing I'd like to say is that this is an awesome quote Andrei Chelichev famous Russian guy who came to Napa and basically made Napa work for BV and basically helped get Napa started declared this God made Cabernet Sauvignon, whereas the devil made Pinot Noir. Why on earth would he say that? Because although Pinot is an excellent reflection of terroir, yeah. it is going to be a completely different wine depending on where it's grown. And it is called the heartbreak grape. It is so hard to grow. There are multiple opinions about what to do to maximize flavor. You have to pick the right clones for the right rootstock the right soil, the right terroir. You have to restrict yields or you're going to get a boring nothing wine like you were talking about, something flat. But it's not very vigorous. In Champagne, it's cropped to much higher levels and they they need to do that, but they're also not looking for full ripeness in Champagne. It's thin-skinned. It has tightly packed clusters. You can imagine if it rains, it's susceptible to rot. The rot's going to spread. Mildew, fungus, mold. You have to do... A lot of work in the vineyard if you want to grow Pinot, especially when it's rainy. And those thin skins are going to mean that it can go bad real quick. That's on the top end. On the bottom end, it's sensitive to root rot. We had a really rainy spring this season. We lost a whole bunch of plants to to root root rot. rot. Right. Root rot can rot the plant from the bottom up. Yep. Also, it's got really low levels of phenolics. So you have this light colored low tannin wine that then when you bring into the winery, now you're going to have to deal with. It's sensitive to wind. It's sensitive to frost. The hail can break the skins. You have to prune it well. It buds early. So you have this spring frost issue. It likes cooler temperatures where there's sun, but less heat. So it needs to be sunny, but not hot. Those two things are hard to separate often. Right. It's just not good for warm regions because that acidity is going to drop off. But then the cooler regions have all these problems. And then there's the issue of clones. Clones can help with resistance to certain things or they can help match things better to the site soil and the microclimates. And there are a lot of different clones that are going to vary in flavor, in yield size, in character. That's great for winemaking. You can assemble different clones together, but clonal variation is enormous. You can easily go wrong, get the wrong clone on the wrong site, and then you've got flavors you did not want. I think we should go on a tangent about clones now so that I can explain what exactly a clone is. Is that cool? Uh, Okay, I'm good. Are you going to dress sideways? Like, why did... Sideways pick Pinot Noir, do you think? What MC Ice is referring to is that the end of 2004, there was a movie that came out with the actor Paul Giamatti and Sandra Oh and a few others. I can't remember the other guy's name, but it was about these very depressed human beings who lived a horrible, sad life. But they went on a boys weekend bachelor. It was a bachelor party or something like like that that. to Santa Santa Barbara, Barbara, the Santa Inez Valley. And 
all the Paul Giamatti character did, who was basically a fairly vile human, incidentally. All he did was talk about how great Pino was and how terrible Merlot was. So that's when I got into the wine industry, actually, just right, as right, that was right, starting. Right, exactly. And it had an enormous effect on the wine industry. And what happened is that people completely cast aside Merlot, which was an enormous hit because of the French paradox. Sure. and the, It's delicious. It's, and it's isn't it fairly easy to grow? No, it's actually very difficult to grow well. And that was the biggest problem with Merlot. It actually needed a reckoning, but this was way too much of a reckoning. Instead of a reckoning, it was a wrecking of Merlot because people who didn't even see the movie, we did a lot of research at the big winery. Most people actually had not seen that movie. No, it was just a tastemaker started to say Pinot Noir is so great and Merlot sucks and people kind of bandwagoned on it. But most of the people who thought that did not watch the movie. It was just a small cult movie, you know? The last time we covered Pinot... I don't think I'd had much exposure to Santa Barbara Pinot, but now that's my favorite Pinot. So it's I excellent. sort of, I mean, I get it why they they picked that grape, at least from there. Well, they picked the grape because the guy was a giant pain in the ass, and so was Pinot. Oh, really? It, we gotta yes. go, I got to go back and watch right. that. It's been years. I mean, the years. fact is that it reflected his elitism oh, and the fact that he could only like something that was so difficult to grow and so mysterious uh-huh. and expensive that, of course, somebody like him, who is this pretentious schmuck, would like it. Very different from... Merlot, which right. was the the everyman's grape. So it did usher in this level of snobbery also. And Pinot has always been, I but just want to be clear, up, Pinot's uh, always been wonderful. But what they wound up doing is planting and planting, planting and planting. everywhere that it shouldn't be planted, right? In tons of places it shouldn't be planted, just to make a buck off of it. And then, you know, fortunately it's shrunk back a little bit now and, and things have equalized a little. But around the world, it wasn't just in the U.S. It actually bled over to the U.K. as really? well. Yes, and a little bit, I think, to Australia. But anywhere that there were English-speaking folks, it definitely bled over. Thanks a lot, Paul Giamatti. Yeah, <sighs> Paul Giamatti, darn you. He's a great actor, though. So I want to take a sideways <laughs> <laughs> step and just talk about clones real quick, because in Pino, it matters a lot. And one thing I want to say is also is a way for big wine snobs to make you feel like crap about yourself. So I just want to explain what clones are. And when it comes to Pino, when you go into to a tasting room and someone starts spouting off numbers of clones at you, you can just nod your head and understand what it is and you don't need to listen to this. And I know some of you are listening and say, but I really love 777. Okay, that's great. But I want to want to just say this. Seven, seven. First, of all, first of all, I'm glad that you were going to you're going to take a step back and just define clones overall, right? Right. So vines self-pollinate and older vines can sometimes morph into different siblings. So the way that you should look at clones is that there's a mom and then there's different brothers and sisters and some of them look alike and some of them have blue eyes and some of them have green eyes and some of them have brown eyes and some of them have blonde hair and some of them have a really salty, nasty character and some of them are super nice because it's all related to Pino. Okay. But these are different characteristics. And what we're trying to get at, as I'm saying this about siblings, is that we're trying to find maybe different aromas and different textures. We've already found these in the vineyard and we know that they're there, or we might breed them to get variety in Pino. But let me be real clear. The clones initially were selected for disease resistance. The Dijon clones that wine snobs get really, really excited about Mm -hmm. in the U.S., six were in that group, and those were selected for disease resistance initially. Okay, so let's just take a, a little shine off of the glamour here. In Burgundy, they do this completely differently. There's a bunch of clones, and they're all grown together, and they add diversity of flavor. Now... There are over a thousand clones in Burgundy by one reading that I I did, but some clones are light and pale. Others are jammy and dark. Some are elegant. Some are a little bit larger cropping. Some are smaller cropping. And this doesn't have anything to do with phylloxera. Well, Uh post-phylloxera, it's interesting that you say that. So before phylloxera, what they did was something called massile selection. They still do this. This is vine selection for propagation of the best vines. You might take 
a clone from here and there. You plant them all together in a certain part of the vineyard. And then after a number of years... It's like animal breeding. Yeah, you, you propagate the them. Ones and yeah, you're you propagating get, yeah. it as a group. And the idea here is to say which ones are doing pretty well and then you get a mix of clones. So not what's best, but what's going to make an interesting crew. Okay. Like what's the crew that's going to work out really well for this wine? That is still how it's done in many places, but Burgundy is the place where they do that the most. Then there was clonal selection. Clonal selection after phylloxera is you can take a few cuttings of the best, graft them, plant them, see what happens, and then if they're good, then you would be taking from that vine over generations. There's a mother vine. Right. And a bunch of clones with the same DNA for consistency, and this was started in Germany in the 1920s. The thing about clonal selection is that it kind of goes against the German need for efficiency because it's slow and very expensive, and it's re- going to require a lot of years of propagation and experimentation. It's great for hard-to-grow grapes like Pinot because the result is, is something very, very reliable. Although it takes longer, you're definitely going to get the result that you want. So in France in the 1950s, they started to realize they needed to select some traits that were going to be good for vineyard characteristics that would make it easier to farm. So they started this selection process. The French Chamber of Agriculture released some clones from Dijon. By 1971, they had already... released clones? You just, like, send them out to... Here's... Send them to your best buddies and No, let they them... said, okay, these are official clones that are virus-free. Right. That people can use. Because we've gone through phylloxera, went through the world wars and things like that. And now the Ministry of Agriculture was really coming up with a way that you could use clones that were clean of disease okay. and that could create more reliable crops so that you could continue to make money and it was a little bit less worrisome. Okay. Originally, it was 111 through 115, and they were for perfume and structure, of course, disease-resistant because they were virus-free. And then in 1980, they released 665 to 668 and then 777 to 780 in 1981, which everybody loves 777. Wait, and then are we were supposed to know of, what these numbers are? No, no, it, but no. Some, these, seems these, like these, you yeah, say that people, people know what do. 777 They do. They do. They okay. know what six. There's a the bunch of them. Okay. And then there were an 8 series and a 9 series in the late 1980s, and they all do different things. Okay. Some had more power, some had more aroma, some were more elegant. But the point was that they were reliable and they were Burgundian in origin. So when you go somewhere and they say they have Dijon clones and they're very proud, it's because the originals, which were so long ago, they're no longer from Dijon. Right. They're obviously propagated now in the U.S. If it's or New Zealand or wherever, came from this virus-free atmosphere from the French Chamber of Commerce many, many years ago. Now there were also, especially in California, there were German clones, Swiss clones, there were Italian clones, hmm. and the California versions are very interesting because they also had clones that were treated from Pomard. When you say interesting, are you saying euphemistically? Well, I'm going to tell you the story and okay. you can tell me if it's euphemistic. All right. These were clones that they brought over from Pomarn and they were treated so they were virus free. And then there were Swiss clones that were used because they were more resistant against botrytis and they had more acidity. In 1951, they were available from UC Davis, and they were known as the Pomard clones, or UCD456. Mm-hmm. These are the clones that, that are from UC Davis. So they were used for virus-free material. Now they're known today for intensity of fruit. Then the Martini clones from Louis and Martini's Vineyard in Carneros. Mm-hmm. Mount Eden clones. This was planted by Martin Ray in 1943 in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And then that was moved over to Mary Edwards in the Russian River Valley. The Hmm. Swan clone, Joseph Swan in Sonoma. Burgundy plus some California clones, some of those martini clones. No one really knows where they came from. Do all the clones have names? Can they be identified by some? Yes, they're either identified by number or they're identified by the Calera clone in Mount Harlan in San Benito County is another one. So you either have, okay, well, we use the martini clones. I'm sticking with the 777. Okay, good. Well, those those are the Dijons are the OGs, right? Well, that makes sense. That's more my style. 
We'll take a step away from the podcast to thank our sponsor this week, Wine Access. Wine Access has great customer service and having worked with their sourcing team, they find the best wines, things that are under the radar. They are the best quality at the best price. Now you will have access to those wines that you can't get in your local shop. So this is a great supplement to your shopping Go on wineaccess.com slash WFMP. Check out the wines that I'm loving right now. See all of the great things that you could be getting on Wine Access's site. They taste thousands of wines a year to only bring in the absolute best. And some of them are my friends and producers that I know and love, Nall Winery and Smith Madrone and Keller. These are all friends of the podcast and they carry these wines and they are absolutely spectacular. With my special URL, wineaccess.com slash WFMP or wineaccess.com slash normal for the wine club, you'll get 10% off your first order. And once you start ordering wines from here, you won't be able to stop. Wine Access is awesome. Support them. They support this podcast as our exclusive sponsor. Check out the wines on the page today. Also, make sure you check out the new winefornormalpeople.com slash classes. There are classes available for the EU and UK time zone, the wines of Piedmont after I return from a trip to Piedmont. The food and wine pairing class is available now, which only comes around once a year. Also, Wines of Australia, which I've separated from New Zealand. And then we talked a lot about Burgundy. Well, now you can take a class on the wines of Burgundy. I haven't offered that in a while either. Wineformnormalpeople.com slash classes. And as I mentioned at the beginning, please consider becoming a patron and joining our fantastic community. If you love the podcast, this is a great way to show your support. Patreon.com slash wineformnormalpeople. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash wineformnormalpeople. There's a link to it right in the show notes. So if you forget and you are interested in joining later on, click on the show notes and it'll bring you right to the page and you can join for as little as $21 a year. Thanks so much for your support. And now let's get back to this awesome show. Here's the deal. It's an old grape. There's a lot of mutations, a lot of modifications, very terroir prone. Some of these things are hodgepodges from the vineyard. That can be another reason for flavor. I am not denying that like martini clothes are pinot. What I'm saying is they're going to be different because okay. we're, we're growing in a different place. The short of it, though, is that when these people start to get uppity about clones, mm-hmm. it's only one factor. A lot more is going to depend on wine growing and winemaking. Planting a single clone for predictability mm-hmm. is going to mean, okay, great. So you have no diversity in the vineyard. So is that common practice, though, is to mix clones in the vineyard? Yes, it is common practice okay. to mix them, but not necessarily in the vineyard. But in Burgundy, the association Technique Vinicole de Bourgogne mm-hmm. is a graded massel combination of clones. So they have like the top tier and the middle oh, tier and the lower tier, right. but they don't do anything except massel selection because they do worry that if you just have one clone in the vineyard, the problem then is if disease starts to take over, it's going to take over that entire section of the vineyard. Whereas if you co-plant, you're going to have a little bit of a safer bet. And there where they've got weather and they've got issues, it makes a difference. Let's move on to winemaking. You had asked about that. Yes. The goal is really to make, for a lot of people, is to make an aromatic, pretty elegant wine. And usually that means that you're not going to use natural yeast. You're going to use cultivated yeast, whether it just be workhorse yeast, because you need something predictable. Pinot is tough. Another thing with Pinot, we mentioned barnyard or farmyard Mm -hmm. or band-aid. A lot of people think, and probably an equal number of people don't think, that a low level of faults, especially Britannomyces which is a bacteria that gets into... Wait, is that the, the Band-Aid yeah. flavor? Yes. Manif- uh, yes. Manifests as Band-Aid? Okay. Yes. Or barnyard, farmyard. Okay. That earthy note right. in Pinot, that's a low level of fault. Now, too much is not good. That's a fault? That's considered a fault? Yes, we love it. Right. So, but that's the whole point. I thought that was one that, of the prime primary characteristics of it. But many people argue that it's a flaw and that just like people say petrol and Riesling is a flaw, which I also find ridiculous, mm-hmm. a low level level of Britannomyces sometimes is really lovely in Pinot if you like it, but some people don't like that as much. It's more likely to happen in Burgundy than it is in New Zealand or California, for instance. So there's that. One thing that they do with the winemaking is cold maceration or cold soak. And this is because the grape is so light in pigment that the grape skins are in contact with the juice before alcoholic fermentation Mm -hmm. to get color 
and a little bit of aroma and a little bit of flavor without the tannin right. and without alcoholic fermentation. So you use dry ice and cover the tank or the container with dry ice. You're going to cool down the berries. You are going to crush so it's like some of them. almost. But it's for several days. So you're oh. not for that long, but for several okay. days. You have to watch for spoilage. You've got mm-hmm. to watch for bacteria in there. Where this idea comes from is that Burgundy originally had very cold cellars. So cold soak would happen naturally. You might leave the grapes outside. They might burst and then they notice that they were getting darker. Hmm. Now, cold soaking is actually controversial. Some people think that it's cheating, that it's not. Yeah, that it's not a good idea. So again, everything about Pinot is contested. They usually ferment it when they do the actual fermentation in smaller open top vats so they can keep an eye on the fermentation and make sure that it's going as planned because, again, bacterial yeah, spoilage is an issue. Right. Do you see why so, I'm bacteria spo- the- so why would it be open? If, it, if it's already finicky, I would think that you would need to have it in a hermetically sealed environment. If you do that, you won't be able to notice if anything's going on. Mm. So you definitely need to make sure that you can see what's going on and test it regularly. Just get like a Bluetooth cooking thermometer and well, stick that in Well, maybe eventually they will. You know, they might eventually be able to do that. There probably is tech some technology that exists, but traditionally you do an open top fermenter. And then you sometimes do whole cluster ferment. Sometimes you destem the grapes. Sometimes you include stems. Often you include stems. And the reason that you include stems in Pinot is oh, to give it extra tannin. Because it's got no flavor. It and has so a it lot of flavor. It has a lot of flavor. It has a lot of flavor. in there just to give it some Get out of here. Some Pino, body. I like Pinot. Look, I do like this. Look, yeah, but a... I love this Pinot. Yes, you like a lot of Pinot. You love Burgundy. I love you Burgundy. Love I love Santa you Barbara. Like Santa I love yeah. New Zealand. Right. So but I thought you were going to let me try an Oregon here. Yeah, that's what you're tasting, right? But it is? Yes, that's from, and that is from Ooh, that's Domaine good. Druin. Okay. Right, so that's one of the very good properties in Willamette. We'll get to where the wine is made in a second. But anyway, let's get back to this. You can do all of this stuff with the stems. You might do this whole cluster fermentation. You might do whole berry fermentation. Mm-hmm. Some people do a portion of carbonic maceration, which I don't think is a great idea, but some people do. And the fermentation is going to change The flavors, the yeast strains might change the flavors again because Pinot is so picky. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you got to ferment it at cooler temperatures so that you can get fresher fruit flavors. If you do a long, warm fermentation, you're going to get high tannins and really bold wines. Some people like that. Then you don't need the sticks and twigs in there. Well, some people do everything. higher tannins, right? Some people do everything. They do everything. Oak is another controversial thing. Mm. New oak versus used oak, the size of the barrel. Most people are going to use the larger burgundy barrels, 228 liters. What about toast levels? Right. No one's going to use American oak because that's too strong for Pinot. Okay. But there's some controversy about how much oak, how much new oak. Most of the old world producers believe that too much new oak is going to mask the grape's aroma. But they Agreed. certainly didn't believe that when Robert Parker was around and they were trying to get his attention. Really? So they went with those trends, many of them, not okay. all of them. All of these are changes and fashions and styles, and Pinot is susceptible as any grape to it. But the problem is once you start monkeying around with Pinot, you can't pull it back. It's not like you're going to see the tannins mellow out and Pinot reemerge. It pretty much ruins the wine if there's too much oak. Hmm. If we talk about the styles of wine, I've already said this, but 38% of all Champagne vineyards are Pinot. It's the most Pinot planted in all of France, really? more than Burgundy. Huh. Yes. Okay. They p- produce Blanc de Noir, right, the white of red, right. which is richer and fuller bodied. It has some red fruit flavors. Lovely. It's used in rosé champagne to give the color, to give some of the berry fruit and flavors a, to rosé. And that's a Pinot? It is Pinot. It's, and it's called Blanc de Noir? Blanc de Noir. Occasionally you'll find Pinot Munet being, because right. that's also yep. a red grape, but Normally, Blanc de Noir is going to include at least a fairly high percentage of Pinot Noir. Sometimes Hmm. it's both Pinot Noir and Pinot Munet, but the finest examples are generally Pinot Noir on its own. Okay. And then it's used in Rosé Champagne to add color, tint, and flavor, and it's included always in the blend, unless it's a Blanc de Blanc, which is only Chardonnay. 
it's used for holding flavor throughout the production process. You know, champagne is pretty hard on the grapes. You're going through multiple fermentations. You've got contents under pressure. You have a lot there, but Pinot holds its flavor all the way through the process. Huh. If we think about still wines, obviously the most common use for Pinot in the world is not sparkling wine, but still wine, which is what we're going to spend the majority of time talking about. But it's also used for rosé because it's high in acidity mm -hmm. and it has a lot of fruit. That's a really great option for dry rosé. Flavors always well, depend who on Who makes the best Pinot rosé? Not who, but where? Work. It depends on the producer, and it depends on how much skin contact they do, and it depends on how like much acidity they get. But so I don't, no, there's I don't no think way of, to really think about that. Am I wrong that I don't really think of Pinot and Rosé coexisting? I, I mean, will tell you, my favorite Rosé out of California yeah? is Carith's Rosé from Brulium. Hmm. Carith Overstreet is amazing. Shout out to Carith. I think she makes the best rosé in probably the U.S. Wow. And it's made out of Pinot. Okay. There you go. Okay. What do I know? Let's talk about the regions where it's grown. Keeping in mind, we're not going into great detail. I'm just going to sort of tell you about the regions and the flavors. If is we this think one about where there's a distinctive difference between new and old world? Yes. Okay. The native home of Pinot is Burgundy. Right. And Pinot gained fame under the Dukes of Burgundy. And they really promoted Pinot as being absolutely the superior wine of Burgundy. They went out and marketed the hell out of it. And today it's widely considered one of the best wines in the world, partially from those efforts in yeah, the 13 and worked. 1400s. The Grand Cru, the Cote d'Or are some of the most famous wines in the world. And the thing about Pinot, which they were absolutely correct about, is that Every neighboring commune, regardless of how close they are, makes a completely different Pinot because it is a complete reflection of terroir. And then you have producers, which add another layer right. on top of it. So there is an enormous range. That being said, it's generally pretty light in color. It's generally acidic, mm -hmm. lower in tannin, and oak is not a big factor. But some are like red fruit and berries with a medium body. Some are earthy and perfumed and elegant. Flavors and texture will vary based on vineyard, on producer, on vintage. And the flavors are going to change based on location. The wines are labeled by place first in Burgundy, then by producer for a specific reason. The mm -hmm. place speaks more to what you're going to get in the bottle than the producer. And vintage is also hugely important because of the variation in the weather of Burgundy. Some years you're going to get really full wine. Some years you're going to get really acidic wine. In hard years, especially the lower end, is going to taste like metallic cranberry. I mean, Ooh. it's awful. Okay. So, yeah, you definitely don't want to buy lower end red Burgundy from bad years. And fruit flavors actually are secondary to other flavors, in my opinion, and I think in yours as well. Yeah, you can get black cherry and raspberry and red currant and orange and things like that. Are but the really, other flavors more earthy? Yes, Is that what, okay. you're going to get earth and mushroom and, mm -hmm. you know, forest floor and, and maybe some spice. Sometimes it smells like incense, like the, like an old medieval church, right. roses, yep. licorice, nuts. It can smell like goat poo. It's, well, I mean, the goat poo. well, there's your botanomyces right there. Right. And then it always has high acidity with moderate alcohol. So you're not going to get high alcohol versions here, but it can be velvety. It can be silky. It can be savory. There's an umami note, that mm -hmm. mushroomy note sometimes in these wines, and they are unbelievable. Some are wispy. Some are a little heavier. They're never really heavy. Right. I will give credit to Jancis Robinson, who says that for young Burgundy, you should drink them within four years. Okay. It's usually village wines. For Premier Cru, which is the next more restricted level yep. of single vineyard wines, five to eight years. And Grand Cru can age, and they can age for a decade or more, but they're not like Bordeaux. Okay. You're not looking at 20, 30, 40 uh, years here. Many people do age the wines for that long, but they're not going to really hit their stride, and they're not going to be great after that. So Most of those aged offers wines. offers me a 1950 Burgundy. You should Pass. still try it, but if you do try it and you're disappointed by it, don't be surprised okay. because it probably would have been better 30 years ago. Okay. So, <laughs> much like me. <laughs> <laughs> and me. Pinot is in the Cote de Nuit, it is in the Cote de Bone, it is in the Cote Chalonnais. The best is in the Cote de Nuit and Cote de Bone, which together are the Cote d'Or. You can go back and listen to those shows. But in the Cote de Nuit, this is really where the most expensive wines are. It's floral and earthy. 
and plummy and some are tannic and some are wispy and most are on the southeast facing mid slopes mm -hmm. from Gevry Chambertin, from Maurice Saint Denis, from Vougeot, from Von Romani and Romani Conti, Latash Richborg, which we mentioned before, are some of those big, big names. And then you have Cote de Bone, which is a little bit more fruity and generous. Grand Cru wines are from Corton, the hill of Corton above Olos Corton. Coach Chalonnais makes great wines. They're fruity and they've got good tannin and acidity. They're just generally tend not to be as complex as the better wines from the Cote d'Or. Okay. Loire makes really tasty Pinot. It's gotten better with climate change, frankly. They're high acidity. They used to be very light, but now in Sancerre, they're kind of like burgundy sometimes. Really? Yes. They're expensive, though. They also make delicious rosé out huh. of Sancerre, out of Pinot. So you can get that out of the Loire Valley. Alsace. Alsace is what? really coming on strong with Pinot. And I am constantly seeking out Alsace Pinot because it is so delicious. With climate change, we see these earthy, smooth, stony notes against it's cherry. It's not like ice wine? Oh, no. No, no, no. Alsace is very warm and sunny. It's one of the driest places in France. And it has a high level of sun, but is not hot. All of the things that Pinot like. Okay. Also, Jura, which we always call the Bizarro Burgundy because mm -hmm. it's across the Bressa Plain. That's a lighter style. It's sometimes mixed in with Trousseau or Poussard in Jura, a little bit in Savoie as well. Okay. And of course, as I already mentioned, Champagne. Germany also grows a lot of Pinot, which is why they worked on that clonal selection because they were already growing a lot of Pinot. They call it Spät Burgunder, which is late Burgundian. It's really the best red wine grape in Germany. It's mm. increasing because of climate change. It's the most widely planted red already and growing. It used to be thin. I feel like in the first iteration of the show, we talked about how it could be sweet. A lot of the reds in the past in Germany were sweet, both because of the palate of the people living there, but also because they could not fully ripen the grapes. Right. So they left residual sugar in the wine for balance. Okay. Now it's much better. It used to be thin and light because they were overcropping it, but now it's gotten much, much better. Okay. So you can look for it from Rheingau, from my favorite area, Assmannshausen, um, from Baden, from Faltz and from the Ar. So those are the areas in Germany. Italy also has some Pinot Nero. That's what it'll be masquerading as there. Uh-huh. In How the northern that parts, flavor wise, it's in Alto Adige. There's a little in Piedmont, also in Veneto, in Friuli, in Trentino. Those areas are all in the northeast of the country, the Germanic influenced areas. So their clones are often from Germany. Okay. These are lighter in style. They can be very tart sometimes. Sometimes they don't get full ripeness, sometimes they do. And it's also used in sparkling wine in Franciacorta in Lombardia, mm -hmm. which is Lombardy near Milan. Austria also grows Pinot Noir. It's called Blauer Burgunder, Blue Burgundy, mm -hmm. but it's usually called Pinot Noir now. It grows in Burgenland, which is where we see a lot of the reds growing. It can be really good. It can be better than Germany. It can have all of the earthiness of Germany, but then fruit to back it up right. because it's a little warmer there. Definitely improving one to watch is Austrian Pinot. And the UK. The UK grows a ton of Pinot for their sparkling what? wine. And they are also making still versions. Again, climate change has had its effect, but Jeez. they make spectacular sparkling wine out of the UK and it's made with Pinot. Huh. Spain has a little bit for Cava in Catalonia. There's a little bit of still wine also. Switzerland is making some, especially in the Valais. It's blended with Gamay to produce a, a wine called Dole. Okay. And there's a few other places in, outside of Zurich and other places. It's also planted all over Central Europe. It is planted in Eastern Europe. These places are generally making thin cherry-flavored, raspberry-flavored wines that are not there yet. Because it takes a lot of skill and expertise to make great Pinot. Some of the Eastern European countries, unfortunately, just don't have the investment to make really great Pinot. So yeah. we, we something to keep an eye on. The New World. You have the U.S., which is one of the biggest Pinot producers in the world. Oregon, which we are drinking right mm -hmm. now, the Domain Druin. The wine reputation is based on cool climate Pinot. As I've said before, I think their Chardonnay is better. But you yeah, have but two I main camps. You've got this bold, fruity Coca-Cola flavor and then some 
spicy, complex flavors. And then there's lots of thin, flavorless wine that's sold as Burgundian in style. I don't know what Burgundy they're looking at, but generally speaking, Burgundian I, wine has a lot more flavor than some of the Burgundian in style wines I've had out of Oregon. I, I was shocked that this was from Oregon. I mean, it's it, because... I mean, from the last couple of reports from Oregon, it's not like you're going to be getting Miss Oregon Pinot. No, uh, but I have my anytime I have, soon. Look, I have said that I think the Domaine Druin makes excellent Pinot. I think Beaufrere makes excellent Pinot. I think Domaine Debio makes excellent Pinot. Mm-hmm. So there are good Pinot producers, but. The problem is it's been overplanted in places it probably shouldn't go. And this is where you're getting this fruity cherry cola note in the Willamette Valley. But you can get these earthy, spicy, complex wines. It is going to depend on the producer, on the vintage, on the place, whether or not you get this very cola wine or you get something that's lighter and more elegant like what we're drinking. Nice save. (laughs) California. Lots of spots that are cooled by Pacific fog. That's what you're going to need in California to be able to grow this grape. You will have fruity flavors. California almost always has fruit forward flavors in everything that they do. Carneros, the Russian River Valley, Sonoma Coast, Santa Maria Valley, and Santa Rita Hills, north of Santa Barbara. Some in the Central Coast in Santa Lucia Highlands, Mm -hmm. Anderson Valley. So if we look at those Santa Barbara in the past had some really bad clones that were like mint and beet and herbal. What? Like when? Before we started okay. drinking those wines. But now there are like red and black berries and plum. Oh, they can the be a little Pinot cola sometimes, but they've got clove and tea, warm spices, and they sometimes have very sharp acidity, but it's balanced with big fruit. Yep. Sometimes they're creamy and silky. So it hmm. just varies. You have the Santinez, which is a very large appellation in the western region, closer to the Pacific. You have Pinot. It's really best from Santa Rita Hills, mm-hmm. which is this windy and foggy area where you get great black cherry fruit. It's pretty tannic and it's acidic. They're bigger wines. They have good acidity. Santa Barbara County is another appellation that you could look for. Great value, ripe fruit notes Mm -hmm. with good acidity. And then Santa Maria Valley, I prefer over Santa Rita Hills, but not everybody does. They're really aromatic with violets and roses, spices, Mm -hmm. and earthy with good acidity and a full body. Carneros is cool because of the breezes from San Pablo Bay in the south. It's got a longer growing season. Those pianos are more like blueberry or blackberry or sour cherry. They can be very high in alcohol. They have a lot of baking spice. Mm -hmm. But they also grow grapes for sparkling wine down in Carneros as well. Russian River Valley is kind of cherry cola with really big fruit, I find. And then the oak is a lot. Vanilla and cinnamon it's got lower acidity, higher alcohol by you volume. Turn that into an icy. I think our kid's going to love it. Right. And it has this kind of marine soil taste to it, which sounds like something I would like, right. but I, I don't love it. Okay. And then you have Sonoma Coast. Sonoma Coast is a way too large appellation, but if you get something from the cooler Sonoma Coast, the true Sonoma Coast, or you get something from Petaluma Gap, then you get things that still have a lot of dark fruit in mm-hmm. them, sweet fruit, but you might get some figgy notes, some coffee notes notes, some black tea notes, which are quite nice. And then the last place in California that grows the wine in any big volume, there's a little bit, like I said, in Santa Lucia Highlands, which is also some people really like that wine, very fruity wine, generally speaking, high alcohol and lots of oak. And then you have the Anderson Valley Appalachian, which is a top Pinot region. And that is the earthiest of all of the Pinots, in my opinion, of California. It's raspberry and vanilla and strawberry, but it's got an earthy note to it that's really grounded. So Mendocino, Pinot, or Anderson Valley is pretty interesting. I should mention before we leave the U.S. that Washington also grows some Pinot Noir, as does Michigan and New York State. And there's just a bunch of places that grow Pinot around the country. That's that. Argentina in the Uco Valley of Mendoza in Patagonia. Yep, that makes sense. You're going to have some there. It's emerging. Not quite there. Australia. Victoria in the Yara Valley in Geelong in Beechworth in the Macedon Ranges. So No good- Tasmania? And in Tasmania, of course, right. We covered that in Western Australia and Great Southern, in South Australia and Adelaide Hills. 
And it's all going to vary, again, based on the terroir and the producer. But because you do have some warmth here, you'll generally have good fruit balanced with some earthiness. Tasmania is pretty cold, though. You might get more acidic wines. Mm. And again, you'll get more acidic wines, but you may get some earthiness and you're not going to get as much fruit. Also, some parts of Victoria are quite cool. Okay. Adelaide Hills tends to be fruitier. I haven't had any Pinot from Western Australia, I'll be honest. Canada, in Ontario, in the Niagara Peninsula, Niagara on the Lake, Short Hills Bench, Lake Ontario. I've only had Canadian Pinot from the Okanagan Valley from the Naramata Bench. What about Vancouver? Vancouver Island also, Nova Scotia, a bunch of people growing it. Chile. The Casablanca Valley, Leda, San Antonio, El Quay, and Limari, way in the north. Bio Bio. What's very interesting is that the Chileans themselves do not like Pinot. So this is what? all for export. Really? They like bold wines. They okay. like Cab. Yeah. But it grows well there. It grows fantastically yeah, well so because then... you have the Humboldt Current coming up yep. from the Antarctica. So in these regions that are being slammed by mm-hmm. the Humboldt Current and being really cool, you get delicious wines. Now, these tend to be more on the dark fruit side, dark cherry earthy, can be tart, like tart raspberries, but usually they're herbaceous. Okay. They're spicy and they have really lovely elegance between earthiness, herbaceousness, and fruit. I think that the Pinots of Chile are highly underrated. And I would say the same for New Zealand. So we did a podcast on New Zealand recently, but I will say this is the most planted red. Hmm. Martinborough, Marlborough, Nelson, Wapara, and Central Otago. And what it has is old world sense of earthiness or of potting soil or decaying leaf or falling leaves, herbs and black pepper. And then on top of that, you get a huge hit of fruit. And they can be higher in alcohol, but oftentimes they pick at just the right level. They're often very soft and tannin, but good in acidity. And they're usually silky smooth. Yep. New Zealand's excellent Pinot. It's a really nice balance between California and Burgundy. Okay. I'd say the same thing about Chile. South Africa, most of it's too hot, but Elgin and Walker Bay are two areas where you can find some Pinot very limited, though. Okay. And that's pretty much it. When I say those are the main areas, that's what we've got. And I've given you the flavor profiles depending. But so what's so interesting. If you buy something from somewhere else and it's horrible, it's on you. It's- well, what I'm saying is you're going to make an investment because it's going to cost more than Cabernet. It is going to be like some sort of red berry or dark berry. And the factors that you need to consider are place, producer, and vintage. Can it stand up the food, though? Yes. What's interesting about Pinot is it does well with things like salmon. Right. It can also, it's a classic pairing to have it with duck. But you can have it with turkey and chicken with so herbs. It can, it's a little more versatile red wine. Did you, it's called did the you, chef's wine. Okay. Pork tenderloin. You can also have it with root vegetables. Mushrooms and pinot is a very popular thing. Beef bourguignon is made with burgundy. Ooh. You can have it with risotto, with mushrooms, garlic, herb-based sauces. Mm-hmm. Thyme is its favorite herb, I think. Just something savory. The problem is... Why don't you try it with your butternut squash soup that you just made? Oh, I should do that. Yeah, that would be good. The food cannot be too heavy or it's going to erase the wine completely. I, of course, like it with Comte because I like everything with Comte. You love everything with Comte, right? Yes. Brie, Camembert. So those kinds of things will go Mm -hmm. well with Pinot. Pinot is incredibly versatile, but again, the pairing is going to depend on the vintage, the producer, and the place more than anything else because it's terroir-driven. I've given you some ideas of heavier styles in the new world, lighter styles in the old world, but whether or not they're going to be good is going to depend on a variety of factors. I can't tell you, actually, I can tell you right now that burgundy is definitely not always good and a bad burgundy is really nasty And California, although it's much more consistent, is sometimes a little over the top Mm -hmm. if you're looking for something more subtle out of a Pinot. They do make Pinots basically in the same style as Cabernet Sauvignon. You can get maybe more of the cherry notes, but just like a cab out of Pinot, Mm -hmm. or you can get something more subtle and balanced. So it just depends 
on what style people are looking for. You need to try a lot of Pinot from different places, and then you need to understand what those places have to offer. In this case, place is going to matter, but producer is going to matter a ton. Because that oak treatment and all of the winemaking that can go into this or lack of winemaking, it makes a big difference. Pinot is a difficult grape. People often say that you start your journey, your wine journey, with things like Zinfandel and Napa Cab, things that are much more accessible to Mm -hmm. us that taste like fruit. You end in Burgundy. Right. And you never leave because hmm. you could have a different burgundy every single day and you, no two flavors would ever be the same. Would you say that there is a wider range of flavor profiles with Pinot than most other grapes? I think you have to find somebody who knows what they're doing with Pinot and has a vision and you share that vision with them. Otherwise, it can go horribly off the rails, which is evidenced by the fact that I have a very set style of Pinot that I like. Right. You don't have to agree with me. But I don't like cola in my Pinot. Hmm. If you're going to make that style, I'm not going to like the Pinot. Hmm. But other people love that style. Yeah. I mean, look, a cola glaze on a piece of salmon... It's delicious. Right. And I'm sure a cola right. Pinot with that would with go that great. Would be deli- I absolutely. find no use for that at all. I'm going to steer clear of all of those producers. But if you like that style, you're going to find all those producers. Mm-hmm. And sometimes winemaking matters more than Appalachian. Right. But usually you're not going to be able to coax those kinds of flavors out of Pinot unless you're already growing it in a spot where it's going to produce that because it is so terroir driven and influenced. Are you saying that? Everyone needs to forgive Paul Giamatti. I don't know. He's kind it's, of a dick in Billions, so I'm not really... He's not a great guy in Billions. Uh, I guess so, you're right. Yeah, I, th- I think we're just going to have to continue to hate Fine. him. Paul okay. Giamatti, I'm sorry. Fine. Yep. Good actor. I hate you. Uh, no, I think but the Pino... But Pino is crazy- recovered from... From Paul Giamatti. Um, somewhat. I mean, I think Merlot is the one we really need to worry about because people have less interest in but making great Merlot. But that's another podcast. Fine, fine. All right, so that's Pino, the reboot. And with that, this has been another episode of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next time.